Glastonbury. part of his election campaign. Tessa Mann explains why the country would be better off if the Liberal Democrats came to power. What is it about Glastonbury that makes tourists flock to the region each year? Michael Eva shares some of his festival secrets and other major headlines around the UK. A round up of the new budget. Deadly small kits UK. Get prepared for the solar eclipse tomorrow. Good afternoon and welcome to BBC School Report brought to you from St Dunstan School in Deputy Glastonbury. Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg visited the region on Monday afternoon as part of his election campaign, primarily in the region to congratulate a college in the area on their outstanding Ofsted report. Clegg and MP for Wales Tessa Munt also visited a Glastonbury secondary school. The visit to St Dunstan School meant that the Deputy Prime Minister was able to meet with the student, senior students and the school's leadership team and governors to discuss the progress the school has made over the last two years. There we are. <laughs> with just 49 days before the general election in May, Tessa Munn, Member of Parliament for Wales Constituency, spent time with some youth of Glastonbury, explaining why politics are important to everyone including the young, and why the Liberal Democrats would serve the UK more effectively than the other parties. Let's go over to Dylan for the report. Hey Tessa Munn, and we're going to ask her some questions. Um, currently, the country is running by the um, coalition government. Yes. Can you explain what the, that means? Yes, what it means is that um, the Conservatives got the most seats, but they didn't win the election. They didn't have more seats than anyone else in the House of Commons. Okay. All right, so the number of MPs they had was enough to be the biggest party, but not enough to be able to vote out every other party. So what they had to do was either they could have gone back to the country and had another election, but actually the result might have been exactly the same, or worse for them. Who knows? So what they did was instead they asked my party leader, um, Nick Clegg of the Liberal Democrats, if we would consider going into sharing a government with them. All right. So what we would do, well, and actually what we did was we had five days of talking about the things we agreed on, talking about the things we disagreed on, and we wrote an agreement which they called the Coalition Agreement, okay. and we signed it and they signed it. And that was how, that's been our sort of programme, our agenda yeah. for government over the last five years. And I think it's worked quite well. Okay. Good. Um, how successful do you feel this has been? I think it's been pretty successful, actually. Um, there have been a lot of our policies that we've actually put in place. And people will recognise them as being ours. The one I use as an example is, it always struck me as absolutely mad that if you don't, if you earn less than the minimum wage, so at the moment that's around about 13, 13 and a half thousand pounds, say, I always thought it was absolutely mad that the government took tax away from you, and then, because you didn't have enough money to live on, you could then apply for extra help from, you know, for, for some sort of benefit, so you can get council tax benefit or housing benefit or whatever. It seems to me if you're earning money, if you've got a job, you should be able to keep at least the amount that is the minimum wage. All right? You should be able to keep your first for thirteen and a half thousand pounds and government shouldn't take any tax from it. Now when I first became an MP, which was in 2010, which was five years ago, um, what would happen was you would start to have money taken away from you in tax once you started earning six thousand four hundred and fifty pounds. And we wanted to take that up to ten thousand pounds. And we've done that. In fact, we're just about to go to ten thousand eight hundred and then eleven thousand pounds next year, and that means that you keep. That will mean you keep the first eleven thousand pounds you earn, and you only pay tax on anything you earn over that. Eventually, we'll go to the point where the minimum wage, that thirteen and a half thousand, 
is not taxed at all. So it just seems that that's a lived-in policy. We went into the last election promising that that was what we could do. What's one, one, one was our major priority was to make it fairer for people who earn less money. And in fact, in, there were some debates before the last election, and the prime minister said, when Nick Clegg said to him, "That's what we want to do," he said, "It's impossible." It's on YouTube. You can see it. It's impossible. That's what he said, and we've done it. You see, so that's why I think coalition is good because we try and do things for people who earn less money, um, and we try and make it fairer for people who are less well off, and we've managed to do that in lots and lots of different ways. So I think it's been a big success. Okay. Um, was the general election due to take place in fourteen nine days? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Why do you think the country would be so better with the Liberal Democrat? Democrat? Well, I have to tell you, big secret, I don't think we're going to win the whole election. <laughs> right? But I think we'll win quite a lot of seats and hopefully a seat like this one, I'd like to, I'd like to have another chance to make it fairer for people. I think we, we've always got at the back of our minds, you know, we're, I'm a normal person, I've worked for 31 years. Um, before I became an MP, and I came, became an MP because um, because my dad said, "Will you stop shouting at the telly?" Because I kept thinking, "That's mad! That's crazy! Why do they do that?" And so my dad said, "Look, stop shouting at the telly! Stop shouting at the radio! Why don't you um, go and try and do something about it?" And that's why I stood to be the MP. I think you need more normal people in Parliament, not the very wealthy. It's quite difficult to become a member of parliament if you're not wealthy. It is difficult. Um, I sold my house in order to be able to pay for myself not to go to work, to be able to knock on doors and talk to people and listen to people. Um, so I think it's important that you have people who've got an ordinary background um, and not just a very privileged background in parliament. And that's a change. And I think the Liberal Democrats are constantly at the back of their minds is they know how people, ordinary people, live. And I think it's a good idea to have Lib Dems in government because we can moderate what's happening. So if we were in coalition with the Conservatives again, say, if the Conservatives got the largest number of seats and asked us, they might not, they might ask one of the other parties, I don't know. We'd have no idea what's going to happen. But if they did, I think that we would bring a bit of heart, you know, a bit of caring. Um, and if the Labour Party gets the greatest number of seats, well, they're not going to win this seat here, but they could win lots of other seats across the country. Um, if they were in coalition, then I think probably we'd bring a bit of rigour, a bit of economic sense, and try and stop them spending so much. So we would cut less than the Conservatives and we would spend less than the Labour Party. Okay. So. Um, how will the recent budget affect young people in the UK? That's a very good question. <laughs> I think lots of you, when you get to 16, you start to be asked to be paid tax. Um, and I go back to the question that, that the answer I gave just a moment ago about taxing people. It would be quite unusual for young people, when, when they get to 16 and start paying tax, for them to be earning that amount of money. They might well be in a situation where they're earning up to sort of 11 or 12 thousand pounds, particularly if they're doing apprenticeships and things like that. Um, my suspicion is that our tax changes, stopping people being taxed at lower levels, are going to help young people a great deal. There's also things like, we've looked to the future, we're trying to get more um, renewable energy. We've done a lot of things. I mean, in fact, you know, I always, my sense is, having looked at what the budget says, it's a pretty lived den budget. Um, you know, we are increasing the, the amount of renewables, we're doing all sorts of things for the future, take a slightly long-term view, um, and then, you know, if I look at the things that we would like to do, those will be announced later on today. Um, and I'd be able to give you a much better interview after <laughs> after about two o'clock this afternoon. But I can't because the announcements haven't all been made. But there are things that we would do if we had a, the things that we would do in coalition with another party. Do you feel that young people know enough about politics to be able to vote effectively? Yes, I do. Yes, that's, that's a pretty short answer, isn't it? <laughs> and I tell you for why. I, every year, I go to the Children's Parliament in Taunton. I go to the meetings of the Youth Parliament locally, the, the, the South West Youth Parliament members. 
and I go every year in Parliament to the big meeting of the members of the Youth Parliament. Um, and those are people who are 11 to 19 in age. And they are far better at debating and much more mature about debating matters that matter to you, younger people. Um, they're much more responsible, they debate much more, much more nicely, more polite. Don't shout and scream and yell like members of Parliament do. I don't, but a lot of people in Parliament do. I think you've got very clear ideas. I think you've had citizenship training and leadership. I know that um, my experience is my policy, my party's policy, is that you should have votes at 16. And I think that's quite right, because actually if you look at my, um, my the people who could vote in the last election, there were about 80... 2,000 of them, and about 25,000 of them didn't, didn't. So, I think it's really important that young people are given the chance to do it. They did it in Scotland, in the big referendum last year about whether Scotland should stay part of the UK or not. And they voted. And why not? And those who aren't going to vote, aren't going to vote. And those who want to vote, will. And I think it's a brilliant idea that, you know, young people should vote. You are well qualified, because the moment you start paying tax, you should have a say over how that money is spent. Um, what what could schools do to prepare students for to vote? For um to vote to vote. Well, I think you do quite a lot. I think it's a good idea to have your MPs and councillors in. And I mean, I know I come into this school relatively frequently, um, and I'm always encouraging schools to to ask me, and so I can talk to you about stuff, and so I can actually listen to what it is you care about. And I think I've been into Strode College recently and they've got big posters on the boards saying register to vote. And I think if you understand how to register to vote and you might encourage your, um, schools might encourage trips to the polling station so they under, people can understand exactly how that works. Um, so you know where you can vote. Have a look at the stuff that's online so that you can see how to vote by post which you can do. Now, I know you've got a few years before you go voting, but I think actually it's a bit like none of you would feel anxious about walking into a supermarket to buy yourself something because it's something you've done since you were a child. And if you have the chance as you grow up to go into a polling station to understand about voting, to talk to your MP, to say, Oi, I care about this and you're not doing the right thing. Talk to your councillors. Go to council meetings. I think you should all go and sit in the council meetings because you're allowed to go and sit in the back of a council meeting. Same as you can come to Parliament. I think you should come to Parliament, you know, and to your school has. Um, so there's lots of different things, I think, that help people feel familiar with the idea of having a voice. And you all vote from when you have a school council member. That's something you do. You vote when you're on, you know, fiddling around on the voice or whatever. You vote that way. There's no reason why you shouldn't vote for politicians. So thank you very much indeed for inviting me here. That's really nice of you, and it's a lovely opportunity to talk to you. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. With the summer well on its way, with the all-important festival season, we investigate what makes Glastonbury such a tourist hotspot and take a look at the most popular draws of the area. First, let's go to Glastonbury Tour, where Dylan brings this special report. Here I am at the foot of the Glastonbury Tour. At the top of that hill, is the ruins of an old church and with some spectacular views. So what's your favourite part about the tour? The lovely, mine is the lovely steep climb up and then the view at the top. Yours? Yeah, I think for me uh, it's the view and the challenge of, uh, the, yeah, it's the challenge of the steep climb. Mm. And how many times, if you could, would you visit the tour? Well, I go up about five, days a week okay. because I live so close and I come out when I visit my friend. Okay, and what do you think is the most beautiful part of the tour? Like, What's your favourite part about the Glastonbury tour? Favourite part of the tour? Probably being on the top I suppose, I mean, the views are outstanding, obviously not on a day like today but it's definitely the top of the tour. Ah, yes indeed, one can see why it's so popular, but what a steep climb. It certainly does have some interesting myths and legends about it. Okay, Hello, I'm Helen. I'm here for BBC School Report today. 
I'm here at the, at the ancient ruins of Glastonbury Abbey and also the supposed burial place of the ancient, of the ancient king, King Arthur. Kitchen of Glastonbury Abbey, and here I am with Liam, who works here. Hello. So, why do you think Abbey is so popular with tourists? For about a hundred different reasons. I mean, one, we've got hundreds of stories and tales about King Arthur, about Joseph of here, we've got myths, we've got legends, we've got a giant ruin of a monastery, and lots of space for people to run around and have fun in. Glastonbury Festival, of course, is also a massive draw to music lovers across the country. And with Kanye West confirmed as a headline act this year, we talked to Michael Evis about how the Pilton Pop, a tiny music event on a Somerset dairy farm, has turned into one of the most successful events of our region and in the music industry. The festival, which employs huge numbers of local people in various roles, is due to take place in June, is already sold out. Let's go over to our reporter, who is with Michael Evis, and find out more about how the event has grown over the years. Of all of the acts throughout the years, what's been your favourite? Oh, it's very difficult to say actually because they all get offended. If I choose one, okay, all the others get really offended. Really? Oh, oh yeah, they do. They get really upset. Okay, I can't ask that question. Can you see? Can you see why? Yeah. Mm, they, if I say Oasis or Coldplay or Radiohead or whatever, all the others are going to say uh, that. Then you two are going to say, why didn't you say us? Or the Rolling Stones are going to say, why didn't you say us? You know? uh, so I can't answer that question for obvious reasons. Right, well, next question. Um, do you think that you're going to retire? And um, if so, will the festival still continue? Oh, I think it will continue, actually, because my daughter and her husband and you know, 12 people are actually booking all the bands and stuff. I've got a team of about or about 20,000 people altogether that are running the show. Wow. So there's a huge crowd of people. Like, and they're putting their whole life into it, you know what I mean? So it's not really all about me. But I pay their wages, so I employ them. And I pat them on the back occasionally, don't I, John? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and say so what wonderful <coughs> uh, job they're doing, you know. Um, so so, so I'm like a cheerleader, I suppose, in a way. I've been here 45 years now. 45 years, virtually non-stop. Isn't that extraordinary? Do you have it? How old are you? Um, I'm 13. 13. That's, and so it's three times your lifetime. Oh my gosh. So Isn't that extraordinary? Story. And a bit more as well, too. I'll add you on as well. How old are you? Thirteen. Thirteen. Um, so, 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 did they answer that question? Yeah. <laughs> I don't do, yeah. So the whole thing will, will carry on without me, basically. Um, I'm getting older now, and a bit more, uh, I'm a, oh, just a bit older, basically. Uh, and, uh, but, so, well, I hope to go on another, Five years? You know, that would take me to 50 years then. Pretty good. And, and, and so I would have run the thing for 50 years, wow. right from the very beginning. It was 1970, you see. So, so I'm going to 2020. Sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah. And so hopefully, then I'll stop then. I mean, I might not. You never know. <laughs> Right. Uh, next question. What brought you to Glastonbury? Well, I, I was born here. I was born in Pilsen. I've been here forever. Uh, and uh, my grandfather died, uh, died just on the road in Buff Town. Uh, 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 and, uh, and so he lived in Buff Town, you yeah, know, uh, for the end of his life. Uh, and. Uh, and I mean, we've been involved with the chapel, with the Methodist a church in Glasgow all our lives, really. And, and what else? With this school? Well, my children came to this school when they were younger. Uh, and um, so I've been involved with Glasgow Town forever and a day, really. Uh, but I was actually born in Pilton, 
uh, 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 80 years ago that was. Amazing. Yeah. It was a big moment. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, that's very kind. <laughs> mm. So there we are. And my father was a farmer. I had quite a small farm and he milked the cows by hand and everything. It was really old fashioned. And I used to come to Glasgow on a horse and trap with my mother, you know, to do the shopping every Saturday morning. I go in the back of the uh, little cart with a horse, you know. And so I came all the way from Pilton to shopping Glasgow High Street every single Saturday morning. Is that extraordinary? I was only two. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. <wow. laughs> yeah. Um, 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 but my mother was a school teacher, actually. She, she was a headmistress. That's why we had to do it on Saturdays, because she's teaching during the week. Mm -hmm. And so she was quite clever. And she made us do our homework and everything. <laughs> 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 she was quite a serious mother. A serious teacher as well, you know. Uh, but sh but driving, uh, driving into Glasgow with a horse and trap is, is is something that I very f vaguely remember. And um, she was standing up me over the reins and the whip and everything. I was sitting in the back, you know. Uh, and um, and shopping in the town. So I've been involved with with the Glasgow my whole life. Okay, next question then. Uh, what are your thoughts on the festival and what it's become? Well, it's grown like mad isn't it? over the. I was started with about five hundred people, uh, and for some reason it's been growing and growing and growing. You know, all the way through. Really. Um, I think it's fantastic, the, but the way that it's changed as well, and so so. so uh, so we got all the best artists in the whole wide world, and uh, 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 theatre and circus and all the green politics, the whole mix of things, makes it very, very special, okay, compared to any other festival. Uh, and so, so I'm very pleased with the way it's developed, I mean, it has certainly grown, and it's certainly changed a lot as well. I mean, it's getting better all the time, actually. It really is. I was getting better and better. Every single year is it's even better than the year before. I got so many people that are working so hard in order to make it work, you know. Mm -hmm. so, I'm so very lucky to have all these talented people and they're working for me really. Um, People in Glastonbury, they're actually running the theatre and the children's area and circus fields. But they're all living in Glastonbury town. Those people are. Yeah. But there's lots of traders uh, 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 from the shops, you know, that, that have got trade stalls at the festival as well. They're selling all this stuff, you know, all the, all, all the stuff down through the high street to, to Glastonbury. And most of those shops actually you know, take stalls at the festival so that they bring a bit of character to, to the thing as well. I mean, a bit of local character to it, you know. So I'm guessing everyone around Glastonbury loves the festival. Really? Yeah, that's good. Oh. And the local tickets go on sale today, do you know that? So, so, so that we allocate 4,000 tickets for the the people who live within about um, 10 miles of the farm, uh, of the site, you know, it's, it, uh, so that they get preferential treatment to buy tickets and so that they've gone on sale at night on this morning, they probably all sell by now. <laughs> but, so we do that for the local area only. And so that's what happens today. So, so it was the right day for them. Okay, next question. Did you? What do you think? Um, did I? When you first started 
Glastonbury Festival, did you think it would become as successful as it no is? No way. No, not my wildest dreams. I wouldn't have done what I. I didn't know it was going to go like it did. Oh, but we're doing something right, you know, and, and the people that have come along and helped us shape it and everything. And uh, um, no, I never would. Not my wildest dreams. I wouldn't imagine it. We're going to go more than one year, really. I did it the first year. We lost a bit of money, so I had to do it again in order to uh, try and get the money back that we lost on the first year. Yeah. <laughs> And, and so that's why we, we kept on, uh, we didn't make a profit until 11 years actually. Wow. Yeah, so it took a long time to make a profit from it. But now you see, we, we give away a couple of million pounds every year to all our charities and things. Okay, that's Oxfam and Greenpeace, Water Aid. And we do social housing in Pilton, which is a huge, huge success. So we've got 22 houses for working class people to live in, and to rent, so that, so that they don't have to buy houses and, 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 and sort of saddle themselves up with a cheap old And we're doing another 14 houses next year, so that that'll be 22 plus 14, how many is that? Um, that'd be 46. 46. 36, well done. <laughs> and, and so people in Pilton have got safe houses to live in at a reasonable rent. And so they never get turfed out unless they don't pay the rent, of course. And so it's another favourite, it's a hobby of mine, really, is social housing. It's something I'm very keen on. And um, next question. Um, what band what have we done? or music do you enjoy listening to personally? Mm. Actually, one of my favourite musicians is actually Van Morrison. But uh, so that's the records I'm still listening to Van Morrison even now. Uh, and the band's playing actually this year. Uh, uh, for the first time for years and years and years. Do you know his music or not? No. I do a bit of the Rolling Stones occasionally. A bit of U2. Oasis. Um, Radiohead are pretty good as well. And of course Coldplay. They're friends of ours. And the Coldplay are uh, 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 now one of the biggest bands in the whole wide world now. Yeah. Uh, and and um, it, uh, so that we encouraged them right from the very beginning. And I gave them a really good slot at the festival about, well, about 15 years ago. And, and so they've never looked back, have they? They're huge now, they really are amazing. But to Van Morrison, it's the sort of thing I listen to at home, say twice a week or something like that. Do you know? Do yeah, I mean, it's a bit unusual taste, really. Have you ever, have you ever heard about Martin? No, no I'll be sure to check him out though. What? I'll be sure to check him out oh, he's, though. Oh, fantastic! He's, he's from the Northern Ireland actually, so he's, he's a proper Irish one. What sort of music do you see? Genre. Where do we go now? Uh, what's what sort of music? What? Uh, what genre? Like what genre? Do genre does he play? The genre, like, yes, funny about that. Uh, um, uh, but now it's kind of, oh, it's very sort of soulful stuff, really. Um, blues, and it's just so, of soul and blues, and, um, oh, but it's very Irish, so it, it's really got an Irish base to it, I suppose. Mm. Look, the number of bands in Ireland is actually amazing, for such a small country to have all these huge bands. It's incredible, really. Uh, 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 and so that Van Morrison is about the best of the lot. I mean, in my opinion, of course. Um, but a lot of people wouldn't agree with that, would they? Oh, you two from Ireland as well. You two have done so well. Yeah. Mm. And there's lots of folk music, lots of Irish folk music, which is fantastic. Um, um, all the river dance stuff and all that is. It's 
It's all so good. Yeah, fantastic. And you know, we actually run a little Irish stage at the festival called the Underground Piano Bar. And they come over from Ireland and actually run the whole thing. You know. um, so I like a lot of Irish music. And next question. If you had one chance, who would you bring to Glastonbury? And this is the final question. Oh, one chance. Um, uh, the Grateful Dead, but, but the thing, Josh Sears actually died. Yeah. Uh, so I can't bring him back, can I? As hard as I would try. <laughs> uh, uh, but the Grateful Dead were top And so originally, one what, what of my main uh, reasons for actually running the event in the first place, because I really like that music. And it's a West Coast American music. and. I mean, it's a very hippie sort, sort of thing, really. But um, I used to go to concerts up in London when they came, when they came to London. Um, um, and they actually played for, for well, they did play for five hours nonstop. Whoa. And so I, so I was there for the whole concert, then come back and milk the cows when they came back. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was so, so keen on the Grateful Dead. Uh, but I was there no more because Garcia died. And I think the remaining ones are called something else now, I'm not quite sure what they call him. Um, so that's rather sad that they never played, isn't it? Yeah, if that was like your hope when you set it up. Uh, yeah. But uh, well, they came to look at the pyramid and everything, and they, and, uh, but they were just about to do it. And uh, the, I mean, I was talking them into it, but so then he died, so that's the end of that, really. So, so that's something that will never happen. And also Nirvana, the same thing to Nirvana, we're good too. Uh, is just puffed up. <laughs> he died, he died as well. So, so the Kurt Cobain died. He had a naughty girlfriend, didn't he? Uh, and, and um, well, and it's debatable, isn't it? Uh, and, and, um, and so I would have liked Nirvana to play as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, that would be good, wouldn't it? But the Foo Fighters are playing this year. Sweet. It's, uh, they're part of Nirvana, aren't they? Dave Crowley, yeah. So, so Dave Crowley is the other half of Nirvana, really. Uh, but it's not quite the same. Oh, it's a different sort of sound. It, more of a heavy rock sound, true fighters. Mm. So that they're headlining on Friday night this year. And they're a huge band now. And it's a great, it's a great, so, so it's a great scoop to have them play for us, really. 